Hello, this is Lux. And I'm Ember. And here we go again, Ladybug. And this is our thoughts on Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Chat Noir, Season 2, Episodes 15 through 18. Okay, let's see. Wow, this was a nice set of episodes. There's a lot of interesting things going on in here, and the, a lot of, like, I only see minor issues, and it's because they're still slightly doing the kid format and the formula kind of thing going on here. But yeah, I was. I really like these episodes, and we watched some of them in English, and I was really surprised at the quality on some of the episodes. Like, one episode I was like, oh, that's, that was better than I've heard before. And then there was one episode where we were like, wow, they nailed it. One episode in English was really quite good, and the other one was okay, but it was still better than when I watched Roger Cop in English in season one. So always nice to see and hear improvements. I still want to go back and watch them in French. So I guess we'll wait until Shout Factory releases the DVD so I can buy it. Yeah, especially the one with rhyming. I really want to see that one in French. Very much so. Because it's probably going to be beautiful to listen to. <laughs> it would also be fun to watch the Japanese version just because if they did it right, because the Japanese language is full of puns. <laughs> <laughs> it could be quite amazing. Also very painful. Mm -hmm. Now all I need to do is finish my Learn Japanese courses and I'll be ready. <laughs> so shall we start with the first of these episodes? Mm -hmm. The whole, I can't wear this mask. It makes me look too much like, oh my god, this costume's too good. <laughs> that was great how the, both Kwamis were like, wow, I love what they do with the stitching. <laughs> <laughs> really nice choice of fabric. And I love how the one thing they were worried about was the mask. I'm like, I don't think you need to worry about that. Marionette more than Adrian, because Adrian's hair naturally doesn't fall like Cat Noir's hair does. There's more variances between Adrian and Chat Noir than there is between Marinette and Ladybug. Also, basic Clark Kent rules. Nobody expects to see someone they know is actually a superhero. Yeah, that reminds me of a great image I saw where um, Lois Lane is on her computer and it shows what's on her computer screen and it's Facebook going, is this Clark Kent? A picture of Superman. <laughs> and I'm like, aha. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a little disappointed in Marinette because she initially went to be an extra. She initially turned down the role of Ladybug. And only changed her mind because Chloe, who has actually made improvements, was going to be Ladybug in the video instead. That was the only reason she changed her mind. You already know Chloe is a huge Ladybug fan. You already know she cosplays as Ladybug. She was much more graceful, <laughs> you know, because she's had all that professional dance training. But... Marinette, it was partially your fault that the singer got akumatized because you ticked off Chloe and a ticked off Chloe is dangerous and is responsible for all sorts of akumatizations because Chloe turned around and shut down the entire shoot. Yeah, which may be crazy on her part, but you kind of slightly started it. So it was both you and Chloe's fault this time. So that's a tie in the little record book here. Because you guys really get to split this one. Because Marinette, you gave in to Temptation, and Chloe, you were vengeful. And it was like less about Temptation that she gave in to, and more she let her anger and resentment towards Chloe overrule her judgment. Because what harm would it do for... Chloe to dance as Ladybug in this video. I mean, you already turned down a chance to play across Adrian. So why does the possible tainting of your superhero self, which is not you, it's one aspect of your life, override everything else? I also love how the singer picked Marionette out of the crowd. <laughs> Uh, pretty much the same way she got chosen by the Guardian. Also, something else just kind of hit me when um, Chloe showed up and Marinette was standing near Chloe, but Clara was dressed as Ladybug. That's kind of a... I'm surprised no one went, 
wait a minute, you can look you look a lot like them. But almost everyone was like, eh, nah. Like I said, Clark Kitt syndrome. Oh, no, can't possibly be them. Marinette's way too clumsy. Uh, speaking of Clark Kent, again, there was a, another thing in one of the more recent movies, more recent as in before the really dark, stupid ones. There was this great moment where as Clark Kent, Superman is standing in the Daily Planet and this kid looks at him and goes, <gasps> <laughs> and I'm like, of course. The kid would like, no disbelief or anything, just, <gasps> <laughs> and he basically goes, <laughs> my indication was he kind of made a motion like don't <laughs> like shh <laughs> and kind of actually now moving on to the whole rhyming aspect because you had to rhyme dance or sing i love the how well the english voice actors handled this like it's like we said before we want to know what the french sound like and i also liked how there was actual pretty real hesitation in some of the voice actors as they were trying to think of rhymes and I also like the point where Ladybug hands a rhyme off to Cat Noir and he goes ah <laughs> I'm just glad that counted because she didn't actually finish the rhyme hmm that's a point there didn't think of that she did not complete the rhyme she said it to Chat Noir who used that final word and rhymed to it if they have to do everything individually then ladybug should have completed the entire phrase and then chat noir would have repeated the last two words optimism cataclysm so lucky for them handing rhymes off worked though speak just hit me i wonder how that rhymed in french because he he says cataclysm in french as well the accent is more like cataclysma so I'm pretty sure, at the very least, they can use a near rhyme, which is allowable. Uh, I also love how when they couldn't rhyme anything, they're just doing this little kind of... Yeah, just this little, like, placeholder dance. You know, something close to what you do while you're standing in line at the bathroom. Yeah, or, or that awkward dance that you're like, I'm, like, I have to dance because I'm here, but I don't really feel like dancing. <laughs> lot like the um, episode from season one, Bubbler, hmm. when it got to the point that the kids didn't really want to party anymore. Ah. So I, I like how they kind of had to, how they handled things and breaking the object with the Akuma in it. Handcuffs. Things got a little kinky in here. <laughs> because handcuffs and synchronized movements. I also love how, like, Adrian has figured out how to, like, hold the cataclysma without using it he's like okay as long as i don't touch anything yeah it's like okay we've got to activate it now we just have to close in and then i can grab <laughs> the object and then it'll disintegrate and the akuma will fly free and ladybug can catch it so anything else you'd like to go over on this episode or should we move on to the next one well another reason i want to see this in french is i want to hear the final music video because in the english dub they use the intro song from the very beginning, which has the spoken parts that give away Ladybug's identity, which cannot possibly be in the music video. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that reminds me of that nice thing, how like Ladybug is like, how about try this? Yes, as we're seeing them be a lot more helpful with trying to circumvent future bad feelings and help solve... The problems that brought on the akumatization and I, I like the final result i also like how even though they're not f wearing the full costume anymore they still switched masks i guess they just felt more comfortable and that reminds me of the fact that when they were first about to slide the masks on after resisting everything i thought they were gonna go like ah, how about this <laughs> <laughs> and actually do a trade or look at each other and go nah couldn't be yeah, I, I almost forgot about those two parts. That wonderful part at the end where like, wait a minute, they're wearing the opposite six masks. They're not, they're not even wearing the same. Jeez. <laughs> and how helpful Ladybug was like, oh, how about this? And so we now get to see why you never allow cameras and live feed in your home. Oh my 
God. Well, it was supposed to just stay within the bakery, and, you know, it sounded like a great idea. Jagged Stone really respects Marinette's work. Marinette loves Jagged Stone's music. <laughs> exposure great. for the bakery. Yeah, great exposure for the bakery. It would have worked out fine, except Jagged Stone couldn't find the bathroom upstairs, and the cowards went, hey, I got an idea. Since we have dead air now, let's go up and follow him. I'm like, ooh. Yeah, so if he hadn't gotten hit with the flower, none of that would have happened. Because even after he got hit with the flower, it was still going well. Marinette's father and Jagged Stone were getting along really well, having all sorts of fun. He got hit with the flower. He totally played it off. You know, that that's professional. Being a rock star, he's used to dealing with live concerts which means you have to be ready to improvise. And I think the real problem here was the fact that the camera crew and the his promoter or whatever were just idiots. They really had no right to chase after him like that. They probably only had the um, permission to film in the kitchen in that area. They didn't even bother to pass it by anyone before they went and did it. I mean, the owners of the home, you would ask them, can we go upstairs and film up there? Because, trust me, filming agreements are very complicated in terms of what can and can't be shown, what locations are allowed to be filmed. There's a lot that goes into those. So, they didn't really have any right to go upstairs. Jagged was being kind of rude checking out the room, because, I mean, you open the door, it's obviously not the bathroom. Close the door, keep going. So, Jagged has some fault for this, too, because he should not have been snooping around. You are a grown man snooping around a teenager's room. What is wrong with you? Good point, but he wasn't finding anything odd about it. He was, like, enjoying the designs and how she's done everything, but I know what you're saying. It was kind of creepy, but he had no ill intentions about it. So, other than the breaking and entering part... Yeah, I understand they had no ill intentions, but it's wrong and so far we haven't talked about is it his secretary or his chief assistant penny and i mean it was very obvious from the start of this episode that she was going to be the one akumatize because she was handling everything and she's another non-new character that got akumatized but she was a background character in the last season we didn't really focus on her at all she was just there with dragon stone and his manager or promotional manager or whatever. Record manager or, you know, top corporate person at the studio that does his records. Who seems to be a really big idiot. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember in last season, I'm like, do we have the right person? Because with the whole debacle with the album cover, I thought Jagged Stone switched companies because the record manager didn't want to do it. And said, no, we want you to be like this top silly. And then Jagged's like, well, I'm pretty sure any other record company would be thrilled to have the second best-selling artist. I don't remember if he truly followed through on that threat. Because it's been a long time since we watched that episode of season one. But if he did, then that might have been the wrong manager or they somehow sweet-talked him back. Yeah, it's kind of funny. The whole episode revolves around Penny getting akumatized. And we didn't mention her for the first part of us talking about this episode. She's awesome. She is. Well, she has to be in order to juggle all of that. I mean, we see her handling so many things at once. And just in a relatively normal secretary personal assistant like Natalie, that would be amazing. But when you add in the quirks of a rock star with a pet gator... She handles stress really well. It's just she finally got pushed too far. Because she normally doesn't have outbursts like that. And so she just asked for five minutes to calm herself down. The problem was, during that five minutes, Papillion got to her. And I love how much respect Jagged Stone shows for Penny. Also, I didn't remember her name as being Penny. So, <laughs> Though I'm also trying to figure out what kind of relationship they were going for. Uh, she is somewhat infatuated with him. He, being male, is clueless. 
but he understands that he really needs her. He may not understand it on a romantic level, but he understands it in the I could not manage any of this without her level. I also love how it's not the fact that he'd lose her that he was worried about. He was actually worried about her as a person when she got transformed. He wasn't worried about losing someone who helps him manage things. He was worried about losing that person. So that's what I really like about that particular part of the relationship. Also, this was an episode where the villains get really close because, okay, she's allowed to be insubstantial. So she can get up close to them and not solidify until she's just about to grab the miraculouses. And we see how, like, ticking the earring off, at least one of the earrings, kind of partially detransforms. I don't know if it would have, have fully detransformed her or if it would have ended up in, like, a half and half state. They didn't answer that. We just see a detransformation start because one of the issues with Ladybug's object is it's technically two physical objects. You have to have both earrings. You don't have a single earring. Like there's a single ring and a single pin and a single necklace. You know, something just hit me in my head here of my theory and looking over the lore and timeline. It's mostly the fact that Earrings. Earrings haven't always been a thing. So at one point, were there something else? Or were they turned into earrings later? Or Yeah, theoretically, they could have been something different to begin with. But if you look at all of the physical objects we've seen so far, they don't exactly look ancient or crudely made. You know, they're very finely crafted. Also, it's the whole magic. That's your explanation? Magic. Ancient magic, but this is a um, electric toothbrush. Magic, ancient magic. It's a freaking electric toothbrush. It even says Sonicare on right. it. Uh, so yeah, there's been times like that where I watch shows and go, wait a minute, this is supposed to be ancient magic, but that's a toaster. <laughs> so anything else you'd like to go over about this episode? The very real embarrassment and how we do get to see the follow-up at school and how well Adrian handles it in letting Marinette keep her little secret and also reassuring, stating that he's very grateful to have her as a friend, which is both relieving to hear as Marinette because, okay, he hasn't figured out, but also the, oh, I'm in the friend category. Friend is owned. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting one of these days if they ever manage to do the reveal to each other. Well, the thing is, as of the Owl episode, the Kwamis know. Which we can talk about later in when the following episodes. But now, Reverser. It was less, his power was less about reversing things and more like doing what he said. It wasn't just to automatically you're the exact opposite of what you were. He specifically dictated it, and also the effect was the same whether or not he hit his intended target. Air quotes on intended because he did mean to hit the bicyclist. Poor bicyclist. Well, when you're writing, sometimes you have to get creative. <laughs> as, as Papillion said, Writers never run out of ideas. Apparently, Papillions never run into writer's block. Yeah. Or, or that thing that you love so much that's killing the rest of your story. L like the Tamer Party from Zootopia. Oh, yeah. There's just times where you either can't write past something or you write something beautiful and then you realize it's not going to work in this story. The best thing you can do then is like cut it out. But save that for later. Because who knows, you may be able to go, I can repurpose that. Yes, save it for later. Because it was beautiful, it just doesn't fit in here. Uh, but yeah, the whole artist block thing is like, so oh, he's never run into that. Because <laughs> there are just times where you're like, I can't, I can't do my art. Why, why can't I do my art? I'm an artist. I do art. It's what I do. I was like, come on, pen, make <laughs> words. <laughs> or... Pencil, you were my friend once. <laughs> Why do you betray me now? <laughs> or hands. Hands! Do what I tell you! Don't look at me like that. <laughs> Artist block aside, 
And I was like, oh, it was, I mean, it was borderline. I'm like, could we actually re akumatize the illustrator here? Because he was severely pissed off because he thought Marinette and Mark played a terrible joke on him. Also, at one point, I thought it may have been the teacher. Because we had two new characters introduced in this episode. The teacher and the kid. So I was like, the kid, since he was first introduced, is most likely, but the teacher's possible. I, I think definitely the teacher at a later date, because he's a very welcoming guy. I mean, Reverser comes in and he's like, wow, amazing costume. Would you like to join us? Yeah. I also, like, my brain for some reason went, Bob Ross? I have no idea why. I think it's the whole beard and slightly gray hair that he had going on. But yeah, that was like really cool. I'm like, oh, that's a great costume. Come on in. <laughs> like, wow, that's an awesome bomb you built. I love the way you did the wires. Something like that. Yes, only a little less deadly. And also the teacher is very respectful in terms of artistry overall, because when they ran Chloe off, he's like, you know, Alex, if she really did have an art project, it was very unkind of us to not let her share it. She didn't, but excellent point. Everyone's supposed to be welcome here to work on their creative projects. And self-portrait, selfie stuff, and any kind of art that emphasizes self is perfectly valid in the art world. But Chloe's looked very slapped together. Also, I bet her assistant did it. Yes, which reminds me of that one point that was actually a reverse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Chloe and... Probably Samantha. I'm terrible with names, so I'll just go with that. Flip places. I'm like, I get it. I like it. Let's keep this up. Yeah, I'm like, this one I enjoy. Uh, also, his design was rather nice. I see what they were going for because it's like black and white, flip-flop, yin-yang kind of thing. But also very jester. And what does a jester do? Jokes and pranks. And, and then we get to what actually happens to Cat Noir and Ladybug. Lady become, ladybug becomes a klutz. At one point I was thinking, you know, that might not actually work on her because she's naturally a bit of a klutz. So, like, suddenly, if it was truly reverse, like, suddenly she's able to do amazing stuff more than Ladybug. So it's like, and the reverse, and the reverse is going, what? <laughs> but again, that points to it being less about him reversing natural abilities and more of dictating what he believes someone's opposite is. But I'm just saying it would have been funny for him to just Reverse! And then, wait, how did, why is she better? That wasn't supposed to, I was also expecting him to turn them evil. That would have been much, much better in terms of getting them miraculous. Because either they're going to be evil and Papillion can convince them to hand the miraculouses over, or they're going to be evil and they're going to use Reverser to get to Papillion to take his Miraculous because evil doesn't play well with others. Yeah, I also almost expected when he hit Cat Noir for only Cat Noir to go evil. Because we've had him do that a couple of times when he's been affected by the Kuma. So I, I saw that going, hmm, will Cat Noir become evil? No, he becomes a pun. Yes, yes, a literal scaredy cat. Puns may be the lowest form of humor, but man, can they be funny. No, no, no. I'm pretty sure the um, lowest form of humor is a shot to the groin. Also funny, but painful because it's funny. And it's funny because it's... Moving on. Yeah, that's interesting because also we, we winced so much the lead up to the reveal of what ends up turning that poor boy akumatized. Because we could really seriously see it coming because I'm like, she needed to leave the word by there and just erase the name or change it to like, you know, John Doe. Or a fictionalized tale of Ladybug's Diary. Yes, but Marinette was in a different mental space and didn't think that anyone could take it as anything other than fiction. Though that... Poor boy, I guess it's because of Marionette. Maybe everyone thinks she's interacted with Ladybug, so her coming up with something like that may not be unusual, but I would have gone, hmm. Well, she did say, don't ask me who it's from or how I got it. Yeah, but the moment she erased the name and handed it off to him, I went, oh, bugger. 
Yeah, I'm like, that's not going to go well. Also, if you really wanted it to go well, you should have been there with the two of them for the reveal. Because Mark's extremely shy. This took a huge act of courage on Mark's part. And creepily videotaping them from a high vantage point. Yeah, that's going to put the poor boy in confidence right there. Mm -hmm. Just brilliant. Also, I like their ideas of the non-evil versions of their akumatized selves being heroes. Because Nathaniel was drawing that before he was ever akumatized. And then after he got akumatized and, you know, de-akumatized, apparently it just got better. And then when they teamed up, they added reverse arm. Like, it's a cool idea because the villains get some of the best costumes. And it would be great to be able to use them. But I'm like, how do you get them back as heroes? Because the power came from Papillion. So where do you get a power source? Yeah, I was actually thinking that this might actually be a slight hint to Papillion doing the whole good thing for an episode for some reason. And re some of his past people who had useful skills and having them assist. Mm-hmm. Apparently the phrase useful skills triggered my brain of, I have a certain set of skills. <laughs> uh, particular set of movies. Like, I will find you and I will kill you. <laughs> Good thing we're not an American kids TV show because I, I wouldn't actually be able to say the word kill. They have to say destroy or get rid of or something like that I'm like so the word kill is a no-no but annihilate or destroy is okay though i really have to wonder about that because i need to look up that particular episode of brave star because i think that guy is actually arrested for murder yes but also remember when brave star came on they didn't really have a lot of these rules until after that whole era of we make this cartoon to sell toys that's the reason we have a lot of these rules. Okay, well, I think we need to put that in when we say the discussion that these rules came in later. So when people come up with examples of earlier cartoons, because, I mean, the guy was disintegrated on air. Youch. But next episode. Which was pretty good in English. I still want to rewatch it in French. And, oh my goodness, so many more Kwamis than we thought there were. And interesting how all the ones that have hero silhouettes in the intro are the ones that are not represented in the Chinese Zodiac. Yeah, that's fascinating. And speaking of the Chinese Zodiac, what is the Chinese Zodiac called in China? I know it's not just Zodiac. I'm thinking about what word they use because I'm, I'm pretty sure Zodiac is an English or European. Some variant of Western word and not actually what is used in China. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're all Chinese Zodiac, except for the ones we already knew about. Apparently in the box are Chinese Zodiac Kwamis, and we also didn't see those items in the box when the box was opened and Marionette got the fox, did we? No, but I had an idea just hit me. I don't know why it didn't hit me during the episode, but it hit me right now. Apparently, when you come inside, you have to bring a gift. And Plague was going to bring food, but apparently also items. And what are the miraculous? Items. I wonder if those items, like, will become other miraculous. Something in there, like, gets bonded to one of these other Zodiacs. Zodiac Kwame. Hmm. So that just hit me. Yeah, well, they they bring gifts, but I don't know that bringing the gifts was required, or is it simple courtesy? Like any time you go to someone else's house for a party, you tend to ask if there's anything you can bring. Like they're cooking dinner, you offer to bring the wine, or you know, someone just got a new house, you bring them house plants. It may just be simple courtesy. But yeah, there were a lot of items in there that have built up over the years. So that was interesting, but it can't possibly be a requirement for entry because Waze had no problem going in. Yeah, but I did find it kind of interesting how it was an item and my brain went, wait a minute, all the items that they have were, hmm, 
maybe it's only these certain Kwame who have like done something with the items and have bonded with them or something. And maybe the others can pick something and maybe we will get other miraculous characters out of that. And not just the ones we see in silhouette in the beginning of the intro. But it is interesting that the ones in the box, with the exception of the fox that we've already seen and the bumblebee, which Marinette almost picked, are all the Zodiac animals. Also, I, I did really like the voice actor for the snake because he wasn't creepy at all. So often they go with a really sibilant hiss and totally creepy for snakes. Hmm. I actually can't remember what his voice sounded like right now. That's okay. But also looking at the box, it's like, are there other compartments that the Guardian doesn't know how to access? Hmm. Well, I think he is like the last one. Or at least the last one as far as he knows. Because of a mistake on his part, bad things happened. Mistakes were made. <laughs> yes, but now on to the nightmares. Ah, uh, which is interesting. Oh my god, that Adrian was creepy. Oh, yeah. Just, wow, like Japanese horror creepy. Yeah, because he even had the crawling and the weird twitching. Yeah, like the well kind of creepy. <laughs> and I'm thinking about the Japanese version. You know, the really creepy version. Mm hmm And a, a little disappointed that they went with the um, bedsheet ghosts for the Guardian. I'm like... Yeah, come on, you can do better than that. Who knows, the guy may be actually pretty terrified of bedsheets. Yeah, but they were representative of the ghosts of the Guardians, telling him how he failed and how they lost to Miraculous. So you would think that they would kind of look like the Guardians, or at least wouldn't be bedsheets. Maybe they wanted to be less lazy and more vague. They didn't want to actually have any kind of rendering what the other Guardians may look like. And I do like how um, there's this nice balance in contrast going on between Adrian and Marinette and Ladybug and Cat Noir, how we have a nice cross going on where Cat Noir's matches Marionette's and Ladybug matches Adrian's in the themes of what their nightmares are. Yeah, I see the Cat Noir to Marionette match better than I see the Ladybug and Adrian match because... Adrian's is a fear of being trapped and loss of freedom. Marinette's fear was that Adrian was totally head over heels with Chloe and she didn't stand a chance. Chat Noir's fear was that Ladybug actually hated his guts, which does match Marinette's fear. But Ladybug's loss of power, I don't really equate loss of power with loss of freedom. She still has agency. She has the freedom to make choices. She just doesn't have the power to back it up. Well, you can also be trapped through a loss of power. A loss of power is a way to be trapped. That's how I equated it, because to me that works with what they were seemingly doing. Let's say I just wasn't seeing it at the time, so. That's perfectly fine. I, I see things that no one else sees. Did I just say that out loud? <laughs> that explains why you and the cat stare at the same wall. Yeah, you, you don't see those ghosts? I, I mean, they have really nasty teeth. They just stare at me all day. I'm actually referring back to a comic. Fun artist. Hootis and Pixie. Look those two up sometime. Great kitty and dog combo. What I also liked about that was that the fears of Marionette and Adrian were not the same as the fears of Chat Noir and Ladybug. It shows that their psyche slightly split. And you can really see that with Adrian. And how his psyche is split between Cat Noir and himself. Because Adrian is a bit more of an introvert. More because he's been forced into isolation rather than an actual introvert who would go, Oh, thank God I'm here alone in my room. Where the Chat Noir power allows him to be out and about and interacting with people and doing things. And there's not really much of a contrast between... Ladybug and Marionette. Though I though based on what her nightmare is when she's Ladybug, she sees herself as being more powerful and confident as Ladybug. Well, especially in the first season, there's much more of a contrast between Ladybug's confidence and Marionette's interaction with people. She's gained confidence and ability throughout her time as Ladybug. 
Also, I like the contrast we get between the two Kwamis here. Tiki tells Marinette the absolute truth. Plog lies and sneaks out. Also, what the heck is up with Papillion? Does he have some sort of magic other than what's granted to him by Noru? Because he's limited Noru's ability to be away from him. And they also pulled that stunt with where taking away Noru's mouth. He didn't take away Noru's mouth. He sealed it. And based on the way things were phrased in that scene, I think it's less that Papillion or um, Adrian's father has extra powers. And it might be part of the agreement between the miraculous, I mean, the Kwame and the person that there's certain rules that get set up. Because if you also notice in this episode, there's rules where they can't speak their owner's true name. And I I kind of dislike that both Tiki and Plog were using the phrase owner. They're living, thinking creatures. Partner, contract, object holder. Because it's very much a cooperative relationship when it's done correctly. Which is what we see with Plag, Tiki, and the fox spirit that I can't remember the name of right now. Noru is the one who is trapped and forced to do things he doesn't want to. But maybe the term owner is more appropriate for the relationship they actually have. Even though Adrian and Marinette see it as a partnership, I don't think it actually is based on the power dynamics. Especially with what we see with Papillion and his Kwame. And how... Tiki and Plague react to Marionette and Adrian because they both go, you are the best version of this. Probably because they're giving them so much freedom. Because it wouldn't occur to them to do otherwise. Friendship tends to work better than coercion. Yes, friendship is more dangerous because someone who thinks for themselves can tell you no, have a nice trip to Hades. But a friend may do things that help you without being asked. They'll see a need and try to fill it. You don't get that with a slave, which is all Noru is at this point. Also, my brain kind of made an interesting connection that maybe they're more like genies. Well, they are tied to an object and they grant powers. And the combination of... The Miraculous of Creation and the Miraculous of Destruction does allow for a wish that pretty much needs to never, ever, ever happen. Uh, we've speculated on that in previous episodes. You're welcome to go back and listen. And just the progress that Papillion is making this season. He's gotten really close a few times with his akumatized warriors. He's learned that he needs to find a guardian to translate the spells in the book and thanks to the Kwame's failed attempt at communicating with Noru he's narrowed down where the Kwame's actually are. Which was an interesting thing when they tried to contact him and they got him instead so it's like calling an answering service like so it's like calling someone and getting an answering machine that says I know where you live. Well I was worried about them reaching out to Noru from the beginning because I'm like how is this going to occur in such a way that Noru can give them information that would help them because especially how it was pointed out earlier in the episode that he can't get far from Papillion. Gonna be interesting how all this stuff reveals itself over time. Yes and I also love how Plague was able to go no that's not my owner because Tika was like isn't that and Plague's like no, no, that's not him. Yeah, and I think he was specifically saying that because that's not the actual person who's my owner. <laughs> because, like, oh, nope, he's definitely not my owner because, yeah, Adrian would not do that. <laughs> yeah, but still, you know, that tends to be, you know, one of those trust things and shows and, you know, who's the clone, who's the real person is the one thing you know that nobody else knows. Being able to recognize the person from a, any type of facsimile. And I think Plag and Tiki would be able to do that. They wouldn't have the issue of, uh, because they wouldn't be relying on knowledge completely. They'd be like, that one. Because they'd be able to sense the miraculouses. But 
if for some reason they did have the miraculouses and then were presented with the situation. I'm thinking they still would be able to tell because I'm thinking it's less about the miraculous item and more about the connection they have with the person who owns them. But interesting to ponder and just the tension. And I hope if they resolve the tension, they do it in a way that doesn't kill the show. Because I don't think the show relies entirely on the tension. Ah, yeah, we're talking about the tension between Ladybug, Cat Noir, Adrian, and Marionette. Mm-hmm. Marion's been, wow, it's a love triangle without being a love triangle. Yes, because they're both in love with each other. They just don't realize it. Going to be interesting if it becomes one-sided. Instead, like, somehow they both accidentally reveal it to each other. One of them gets revealed and the other goes... Which is quite possible. Because I think the Kwamis have enough restraint. But if I understand the rules correctly, they're only not able to say their owner's name. So Plague would have no trouble saying Marinette, and Tiki would have no trouble saying Adrian. We've heard her say Adrian in the past, though that was before she knew the identity. But still, I think they're only restricted from saying their own owner's names. Have we talked enough? Is there more we should go over, or should we start wrapping things up? <laughs> well, even with the pauses, we've devoted at least 10 minutes per episode. Though I'm sure the final one will edit down to less than that. But another thing that was interesting about the uh, Sandboy episode was this was an occasion where we didn't witness the akumatization. Yeah, we just heard about it afterhand. Which was also interesting because I'm like, have Ladybug and Chat Noir gotten accounts of what happened from people before? Or is this the first time of how they're hearing it? Because Marionette has witnessed akumatizations, but that doesn't tell you the same thing as getting an actual account of it from the per akumatized person's perspective. Though very creative is like, how do you protect against that? You can't control your dreams. And to pick up on the negative emotions of someone's dreams, getting creative there. Also, I just thought of a concept for an episode where the entire episode is just them protecting someone from getting akumatized like the person stays negative throughout the entire episode and the butterfly is following them around but mary but ladybug and cat noir are keeping the person from the butterfly until like the very end then we go into a two-parter that would be interesting they spend like the entire time like moving the person trying to cheer them up but if they were doing that you would think marinette could use her yo-yo in its net form to capture the akuma because there's nothing as far as I know, saying that she couldn't purify an Akuma before it infects an object mm. because she's only able to purify the Akuma once it's been separated from the object. So in theory, I would think she, as long as she could catch it, she could de- Sorry, we watched English. I was about to say de-evilize. That she could purify it back to its regular level. Hmm. Which is a fun concept that popped into my head. Mm -hmm. Also, when the butterflies are purified and set free do they go back to papillion or do they just fly off if they go back to papillion why have ladybug and chat noir never tried to follow one because they may not have thought of that <laughs> that may actually not be obvious to them and it might not even happen because we never actually see a purified butterfly return it just there never seems to be any fewer but that could just be because of footage reuse because it's always the same footage. Well, there's plenty more episodes for us to watch. So look, at, look forward to more of our episodes. This has been our thoughts on Miraculous. The Tales of Kitty Bug. Kitty Bug? There I go again. <laughs> the Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. Season 2, episodes 15 through 18. Hey, you made it to the outro again. I'm impressed because our average watch time says you shouldn't have made it here. So, if you're hearing this, thank you. If you're not hearing this, you'll never know. So, so sad. Uh, usual YouTuber requests, like, subscribe, ring the bell, share, watch other videos. We have them in playlist format for your convenience. And when you're ready to leave, we have links for Lux's art, Lux's Patreon, Lux's Tumblr. Well, that's kind of also Lux's art, but there's other art on there too. 
Um, I have a little section of Tumblr, kind of uh, more tips and tricks and price saving. Trust me, you don't want to see me draw. If you guys really want to see me draw, we'll, we'll like try to set a Patreon goal and you guys pledge that and say that's what you want and we'll do it. But we won't make it a formal goal. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. Feel free to check out other stuff. If you don't feel like it, that's okay too. The, the internet's a big place. We're just in one tiny little corner of it. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.